Welcome to this talk entitled The Computer and Me. I was to have given this talk on October 1st of last year uh, for my farewell from both the CWI and the University of Amsterdam. The talk is entitled The Computer and Me uh, because I look at my personal experiences with computers and computer research. Uh, the message, the take-home message, if you will, that I want to convey in this talk is uh, that uh, we should change the way we teach the foundations of computer science to our students in order to relate more closely to their context. Uh, the farewell from the University of Amsterdam and the, the CWI I have worked at uh, both these places a couple of times. I worked at the CWI three times in three different periods and at the University of Amsterdam uh, in two different periods. Uh, the next slides were, will just contain the CWI logo as I was employed mostly at the CWI. Uh, but at the end, the logo of the University of Amsterdam will reappear. Uh, the first time I met a computer was in 1975. I was a student of mathematics at Utrecht University, and Utrecht University had one computer in the Academic Computer Center Utrecht. Uh, as a student of mathematics, you didn't involve with this computer at all until we took a course on numerical mathematics and we had a practical assignment to go with this course. Uh, we got the assignment that we should, uh, by means of the computer, calculate the zeros of a mathematical function that was given to us. Now, in order to do this assignment, we first were taught uh, a computer language uh, called ALGOL 68. And, um, well, then we had to write a program in this computer language and implement it and feed it to the computer and uh, calculate the zeros of this mathematical function. The method was the method of Newton Raphson that people in mathematics will be familiar with. Okay, so uh, we learned this uh, computer language, uh, ALGO 68, in, uh, in two hours. And then we had to, uh, then we wrote the computer program by hand, and then we had to write them on punch cards. Now I have a number of punch cards here. Uh, older people will recognize this because they use them in the, in the gyro uh, payments, for instance. Uh, and it, uh, each of these cards contains on the top a line in your computer program. And uh, each symbol in this line, on top here, is coded by a number of holes underneath. And the computer uh, will, by shining a light, uh, be able to read these holes. And, uh, well, th so this is how you prepared your computer program. So you wrote your computer program line by line on these cards. And then you entered your data also on the, these cards. And then when you had assembled your pack of cards, uh, you write them on a special kind of typewriter, um, then you took this pack of cards to the desk where the computer operator sat and you handed them in. And the computer operator then put them in the queue with, uh, with the other programs, with the other jobs that the computer was supposed to do. Okay, when you had handed them in, you uh, sat down again and you waited for a couple of hours until you got the answer from the computer and the answer was written on uh, printout form like this. And, well, usually uh, it involved uh, <clears throat> that you made a mistake somewhere and it was just a dump. Now, students couldn't read this dump and so the computer center contained a number of people that we call dump gurus, and they could read what the computer was uh, saying here. Uh, they could say, hmm, well, if I look at this, uh, I think you made a mistake in your line number 10, and I think you're missing a comma there. So uh, you went back to your set of punch cards, 
You fished out uh, card number 10, you checked it. Ah, oh, yeah, I did miss a comma there. And so you went back to your typewriter, you threw away this card. You produced a new card that was presumably correct. You inserted it in your pack on the right spot, yeah? Uh, because otherwise it does go wrong. And then you go through the process again. And if you're lucky, you only have to do this three, four, maybe five times until you have everything correct and you get your answer that you wanted from your computer. Well, so you were happy and I thought, well, computers is not for me. Uh, I think this is so cumbersome, this is so trying process, uh, I don't want to go through this again. So I thought, well, I'll stick to mathematics and uh, I will not involve myself with computers at all. Okay, so the second time I met the computer was almost 10 years later. Uh, I was just employed as a postdoc at uh, CWI and uh, I uh, was hired on this uh, new type of funding uh, at the CWI. This was funding of the European Union. And this was part of the first framework program of uh, the European Union called ESPRI-1. ESPRI stands for European Strategic Program for Research in IT. And yes, uh, suddenly I found myself working in IT. I didn't know much about computer uh, science, but I did know about mathematics and apparently uh, this worked, uh, according to my boss, this could work very well in uh, computer science as well. So, um, when I uh, started at CWI, I at uh, some moment got this terminal on my desk and what was I supposed to do with this terminal? This terminal was connected to a famous m computer called AMC VAX and I used this uh, terminal in order to send emails to the co-workers uh, that we had in the European program. So, uh, this project contained scientists from different countries and people from uh, uh, private companies as well. The, the main partner for us was Philips in Eindhoven. And so within the project we sent emails to each other all the time. Now this was before internet existed, uh, so uh, these, when you wrote this email you wrote it on your terminal and uh, the computer uh, the MC Vax would call by telephone uh, other computers and by that means passed on this message until it reached uh, the, 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 your colleague on the other side. And so within one or two days this uh, email was delivered and uh, the, your colleague could write back and, and so this was a very efficient way of communicating with someone in a different country, I thought. And by the way, I thought also this, uh, I, in retrospect, I find also that uh, European programs are a very good thing and it contributed very much also to the unification of Europe because we learned how people from other countries worked, uh, we conversed with them almost on a daily basis and by that means we got to know the differences of the different European countries and we could still work together in a good way. So I think that was very favorably. The, the thing I want to emphasize at this point is that this, a, this is a very different computer to the computer I was used to 10 years before. The computer 10 years before was a deaf, dumb and blind computer. It, it had no sensors or actuators. All it did is you give it an input at the start and it computes an output. So it's, it computes a function from input to output. And the computer 10 years later, it was interacting all the time. It was interacting with you as a user, it was interacting with other computers by means of telephone calls, and uh, so it, it wasn't computing a function, it was executing a process. And the process was the interaction with different parties all the time. So this is a very different computer, okay? So, <coughs> as of 84, 
I slowly turned into a computer scientist. And uh, in the course of uh, the years after, I got very much interested in the foundations of computer science. Since, well, I came from the foundations of mathematics, so what are the foundations of computer science? So I concerned myself with questions like, what is a computer? What makes something a computer? What can a computer do? And what can a computer not do? Are there limits to what a computer can do? Now, uh, these basics, uh, these foundational questions of computer science, uh, we teach to all our first year students uh, in uh, programs on computer science. And usually this is called a course on automata theory in formal languages. And so I got to teaching this course uh, a number of times. And central to this course, the thing I want to uh, take out here, uh, is uh, the Turing machine. And the Turing machine is a model of a computer that tells us what a computer is. And also, by means of this Turing machine, we can uh, point out what a computer can do and cannot do. So what is a Turing machine? Well, uh, you see the name Turing. It was invented by Alan Turing in 1936. Uh, this was before any computer existed, so he didn't come up with this as a, a model for what a computer is. This was impossible. He, uh, denote, he noted this as means of what a human brain does when it calculates a mathematical function. And what is it? Well, the, the computer exists of a central unit, a state register called here, and, uh, and a tape. Uh, it's a tape that contains a number of cells, and in each cell there is a symbol. And here you see A's and B's and C's, and, but usually in a computer these are just zeros and ones. If you want to, you can look at this, these A's, B's and C's as zeros and ones. <clears throat> and at each moment in time, the computer is looking at a particular cell. It's connected to one particular cell. And what can it do? It can read what's in the cell. So in this case, uh, it reads the symbol A. It can change what is in this cell. It can change an A into a B. And then it can move either one step right or it can move one step right, left, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and so it can move one place, it can read, and it can write. And in order to tell you in a, uh, in a bit more detail uh, what a computer looks like, I will show you this movie. Uh, this movie was made in uh, 2012, and we celebrated the Turing year at the University of Amsterdam. And um, uh, here you see a, a Turing machine that, we, that was built at CWI in that time uh, by means of Lego. It's a Lego Turing machine. And uh, you can see the tape going from left to right. And here you see the central unit. Uh, and uh, as I explained to you, uh, this is the central part of the computer. And um, well, here you see the tape. And you see zeros and ones here. If uh, the thing is up, it's a one. If it's down, it's a zero. And um, now for the, the computer program it's executing, what is two plus two? And uh, indeed, it's not so simple for a Turing machine to answer this question. Um, I have to, yeah. Um, you have to move the tape le left and right uh, each time. You have to uh, look at what's in the uh, what's in the position, what's in the cell, and you uh, are able to uh, change the contents of a cell. Here it's looking, and here it's changing the contents from a zero to a one, or from a one to a zero. And this is everything. Uh, this is the way the uh, Turing machine calcul calculates the function. And so, what's the answer? What's the outcome? There you see it on the tape. Well, maybe you don't see it, but there it is. Uh, indeed, it's four. And uh, so this computer, uh, this Turing machine calculates uh, addition. 
And okay, so here are the credits to the movie. You can still find it on uh, Vimeo. And um, I, it's a neat machine. It, it's difficult to calibrate, so it's difficult to show it in practice, but, but it's still somewhere on the second floor of the CWI building. Okay, so let me continue. Uh, okay, so uh, what is the basis of the foundations of computer science? It says that the Turing machine can do everything any computer can do. And so the, there's this underlying thesis. It's like a basic tenet of computer science. And it says that, um, well, here you see a picture of Alonzo Church. Alonzo Church is my scientific grandfather. So uh, my PhD advisor had him as a PhD advisor. And uh, well, he came up with a different computational model, but it's equivalent to the computational model of the Turing machine. And so the thesis, this basic tenet, it's called the, the Church-Turing thesis. It's named after both of these persons. And so what is this thesis? It says that anything a computer can do, now or in the future, can also be done by a Turing machine. And if it cannot be done by a Turing machine, then it cannot be done by a computer, now or in the future. Of course, this is under the assumption that you have enough time and enough memory to calculate. And so this is a, a n a not a thesis that you can prove, but you can only show that it holds by means of, uh, well, by means of coding, uh, many things we find in computer programs by means of a Turing machine. And um, yeah, well, uh, just using this in practice and showing that uh, it's possible to code everything by means of a Turing machine. Okay, uh, but uh, now uh, the, the difficulty is that this Turing machine is really like the first computer that I showed you. Uh, and that's a, a, a computer that can only compute a function. Whereas the second, uh, the Turing machine, is really a deaf, dumb, and blind computer. It does not interact uh, with the user. It, it had the only interaction with the user is the pr provision of the uh, computer program at the start uh, and the uh, collection of the uh, answer at the end. And if I look at a modern day computer as, as this self-driving car that I show you here, it's a modern day computer. And this computer, this modern day computer, is all about interaction. Uh, uh, it's hard to imagine that you can code this computer in this self-driving car by means of a Turing machine. Uh, because that would entail that every interaction along the way when it's driving, has to be done, has to be put on the tape beforehand. And uh, you can only see uh, what it has done at the end, when it has reached this destination or made an accident along the way. Whereas, in fact, this computer is interacting all the time. It's full of sensors and actuators, and uh, it needs to see this pedestrian when it crosses the road. So. Uh, the Turing machine model that we have uh, in, in this course on the basics of computer science is really a very old-fashioned computer. It's a computer before the advent of the terminal. Uh, it does not interact at all. And uh, so what I uh, aim for is that we should have a better Turing machine that can interact. Now, okay, uh, so of course this uh, idea is not new. Uh, this idea has been uh, around for a long time. And so why hasn't it happened yet? Well, I'll go on to explain to you why uh, this doesn't happen, hasn't happened yet, and why students still are, are taught by means of this very old fashioned computer. And that's because uh, it was difficult. And so uh, here I show a picture of Robin Milner. And uh, he said at some point, uh, you cannot just add interaction to the model that we had before. We have to start all over again. Uh, if we want a theory of uh, interaction, 
a theory of concurrency, as he, uh, he called it, uh, we require a new conceptual framework. We have to start all over again, and not just a refinement of what we find natural if we do sequential computing, I if we program by means of uh, computable functions. So we have to start all over again, and only then uh, we can um, we can do uh, what is right. Uh, we can have a, come up with a good theory of interaction. Okay, so uh, he and many others proceeded to do that, and uh, concurrency theory has many strands to it uh, historically, and one of these strands uh, within computer. Com Currency theory is called process algebra, and this is the strand that I have been working on for a long time. So Robin Milner came up with his uh, personal brand of process algebra. It was pre he was preceded by Hans Bekic, who really laid the foundation for this type of work. Uh, but then Tony Hoare is also uh, a very well-known name in this respect. And, uh, well, they each come up, came up with their own brand of uh, process algebra. And the two pictures that I show you here, these are the pictures of uh, Jan Willem Klopp and Jan Bergstra. Uh, they also came up with, uh, this, uh, with their own style in process algebra. And actually, this was the style that was mostly uh, algebraic, that was mostly mathematical. And uh, I started working with uh, Jan Willem and Jan, and in fact, uh, Jan Bergstra was my first boss. And uh, so I started working on uh, process algebra, their style. And I worked uh, within uh, process algebra for 25 years, I think. And uh, if you want to summarize my work in uh, process algebra, it can be summarized uh, the best way by means of these two books. Now, let me take a sip of water. Uh, the book on the left is the first book. I wrote this together with uh, my first PhD student uh, after his PhD, uh, Peter Weiland. And uh, this book came out of the course I started teaching at the University of Amsterdam when I was employed there for the first time. So it appeared in 1990, and it was just uh, the working out of the class I taught, the course I taught at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, so that was 1990. The second book on the right-hand side was, uh, appeared in 2010, so uh, 20 years later. And uh, what the book on the right, I wrote that together with uh, Tom Buster and Michel Reniers, uh, two other of my PhD students uh, after their PhD. Uh, and um, so what the book on the right is, it, it is the definite uh, compilation of all the work on process algebra, also in the styles of Hoare and the styles of Milner. And uh, so it combines, it compiles all the work on process algebra over the years. And I must say, this work was um, an exponent uh, of what you could call European computer science that was funded by the European Union. So you could see that this is a product of Europe because it entailed people from different countries of Europe. And uh, well, it all comes together in this book. And um, well, uh, that finishes more or less what process algebra is about. So you may wonder, what did I do next? Well, what I did next was to get back to the original question. That is, the integration of, uh, of automata theory, as we teach it to first-year computer science students, and uh, the, the process theory that uh, is shown in this book. So it's the adding of interaction to Turing machines uh, uh, by, uh, and therefore turning them these old-fashioned computers into modern computers. And uh, the work, uh, I started this work on, oh, okay, now this is a repeat of what is automata theory and formal languages all, is all about. So uh, basically, 
the Turing machine is a, com uh, is a model of a computer with a memory, and this memory is in the form of a tape. Uh, it, this is modeled by a Turing machine, and it defines, as I said, a computable function. And now there's a variant of this, there's a more limited variant of this, where you have only a limited kind of memory, and that is a memory in the form of a stack. And a computer with a, with a memory in the form of a stack uh, is described by means of uh, what we call a pushdown automaton, and it defines a pushdown language. A language is a particular kind of function. Uh, and then, thirdly, uh, a computer without a memory, that's the most simple form, that is given by means of a finite automaton, and that defines a regular language. Okay, so what is this uh, integration of process theory with uh, automata theory all about? Instead of a computable function, we want an executable process yeah, with interaction. Instead of a pushdown language, we want a pushdown process. And instead of a regular language, we want a regular process. And so this is what I started working on. And I started working on this in 2004. Here you see a picture of the central square in the village of Camerino in Italy. And on the left you see uh, the, the colleague uh, uh, Flavio Corradini that I spent uh, two months in a sabbatical with. And on the right you see my wife uh, Maria. And so we were living there for two months. And while we were there, uh, we studied this, pro uh, this open problem that had been open for a number of years. And uh, that goes back to one of the theorems in, um, in automata theory, namely that each regular language uh, is given by uh, an expression in a certain language. It's called a Kleene star expression. You see a picture of Stephen Kleene on the right. And uh, when you take the step from a language to a process, this theorem doesn't hold anymore. Well, it does hold in one direction. Uh, any Kleene star expression will give you a regular process, but there are regular processes that cannot be given by a Kleene star expression. And so, where does this mismatch come from? Which is the, the subset of regular processes uh, of uh, regular processes uh, we can describe by means of a Kleene star expression? This was an open problem stated by Robin Milner in 1984. And uh, well, we solved this problem and we wrote an article together and later we, uh, we had a, as a co-worker Clemens Grabmeier. And finally, we published this, uh, this solution in the Journal of the ACM in 2007. And in the introduction to this uh, article, I lay out my plan for the integration of process theory and, uh, and uh, automata theory. Uh, in the years after that, I worked uh, on this uh, integration uh, a lot. And my main co-worker in this endeavor is Bas Lüttig. You show, I show the picture here on the right. And uh, I work together with Peter Kuipers and Tim Willemsen. We had a, a couple of uh, PhD students, namely Paul van Tilburg and Fai Young. Young. And we had a number of uh, master students all working on this. And so it had developed, and I taught this integrated course two students a uh, number of times. And uh, so what did we find? Uh, we found a number of theorems. So first look at the finite automaton, look at the regular languages, uh, where the basic theorem is that a regular language is given by a linear grammar. And uh, well, that's almost true for regular processes as well. A regular process is given by a right linear grammar, so only on the one side, not on the other side. And uh, I already mentioned the second theorem. A regular language is given by a Kleene expression, a star expression. But a regular pro uh, process is given by a Kleene expression only if we enlarge this language with a form of synchronization. And uh, looking at the pushdown automata, uh, 
the famous theorem is that a pushdown language is given by a context-free grammar. Uh, I, I'm not explaining what a context-free grammar is. Uh, but for the processes, a pushdown process is given by a context-free grammar, yes, but only if we add some notion of state awareness. And this, the, the pro this proof was completed just this year, uh, well, last year, uh, and so that's very new. And the other theorem is that you can write a pushdown process as a regular process communicating with a stack. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have a different version of the Turing machine, namely a Turing machine that can interact, and we call that a reactive Turing machine. So it's, uh, in our view, a better model of a computer with a memory, a better computational model, uh, a memory in the form of a tape. Uh, and so this reactive Turing machine, it defines not a computable function, but it defines an executable process. And executable processes can interact, they are, uh, as we call it, closed on the parallel composition. And uh, you can write any executable process by means of a regular process that com is communicating with a tape. And uh, for normal Turing machines, uh, we have what is called a universal Turing machine. Here we also find universal reactive Turing machines, but only up to some given branching degree. As again, you get a richer theory, you get a more detailed theory, you get, in my view, a more beautiful theory than the theory that uh, we had in the old-fashioned automata theory course. Uh, I just give you an example here of, of an executable process. Uh, this is the, the queue, the first in, first out queue, the FIFO queue, which is a well-known process uh, from computer science. You can always enter something into the queue, uh, but you can also read out at any time the head of the queue. And you can see that uh, the picture for the Turing machine, for the reactive Turing machine for this queue has only four states. And uh, so it's pretty easy to describe this process by means of a reactive Turing machine. And uh, you see on the bottom there, this is uh, figure 5.9. In the meantime, I've written some 160 pages of uh, course notes. And uh, so here's the title slide, the title page of uh, these course notes. It's called Models of Computations, Automata, Formal Languages, and Communicating Processes. And so this is the last version of these notes. And so if you're wondering what I will do after uh, my uh, retirement, uh, uh, then uh, what I will do, what I want to do, I'm not, I do not know if I'm succeeding. Just like I wrote the first book on process algebra, I want to turn these course notes into the first book on uh, the integration of process theory and automata theory. So this is what I want to focus on uh, in, in the remainder of my career. The last part of my talk uh, concerns a number of thank yous uh, to people that were important in my career. First of all, I want to thank my parents for seeing the value of higher education, and this includes the gymnasium. I want to thank my high school math teacher, Theo Standa, for inspiring me to study mathematics. I thank my master thesis advisor, Henk Barendrecht, for showing me the thrill of scientific research. This is my PhD advisor, Wayne Richter. Uh, I'll have you know, he always closes his eyes when you take a picture. And I learned from him even if you don't solve the big question, you will find lots of interesting stuff on the way, in trying. Jan Bergstra was my first boss. I learned so much from him, in particular about research management. Jaco de Bakker was my boss in the second period at CWI. He was very considerate in a difficult period in my life. At that time, 
Corbeil was director of CWI. He showed me that this is a difficult job, but a great job. At the time, Martin Rem was the Dean of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science of Eindhoven University of Technology. He employed me in Eindhoven, where I worked, I've worked for over two decades. I am proud to have contributed to the Brainport ecosystem, which to me is the prime example of a well-working triple helix. At the time, Koos Roda was Professor of Systems Engineering in the Department of Mechanical Engineering of Eindhoven University of Technology. He got me interested in systems engineering and I became his successor. The department has uh, great engineers, both uh, staff and students. In 2010, Onno Boxma was member of the board of CWI. He encouraged me to apply to the job of director of CWI. When I started as director of CWI, Peter van Laarhoven was chairman of the board. He always gave me his full support and encouraged me to keep improving myself. Leen Torvliet brought me back to the University of Amsterdam, to the Institute of Logic, Language and Computation. The ILLC is a great institute, and the students of the Master of Logic are excellent. At CWI, I am indebted very much to the members of the management team. We worked as a team to face the challenges coming to CWI. Let me not forget the previous members of the management team I worked with, Rob van der Meij, Linda Hartman and Barry Koren. I want to thank all the people at CWI, NWO and ILLC I worked with. There are too many of, to mention all of them separately. A special word of thanks to all of my students. As a co-promoter, I advise Peter Weiland, I mentioned him earlier, and Schauke Mau and Jan Frieso Grote. You see their pictures here. They were supposed to have spoken at my farewell symposium. I was first promoter a total number of 31 times and I showed Twan Basta and Anna Sokolova here. They were also speakers at my farewell symposium. Finally, I was uh, second promoter for 23 times. I show here uh, Twan nee, Van Fokking, who was to have been the chair at my, the chairman at my farewell symposium. I thank Jaap Schouten and Stan Giele. They were my bosses at CWI after the transition. I thank them for their support. I thank Ide Venema and Sonja Smets, my bosses at the ILLC, for their support and friendliness. This is Jeanne, my first wife, mother of my children. She died of cancer at the age of 36. Jeanne. You will always have a special place in my heart. This is my family. This picture was taken at the wedding of Maria and me almost 29 years ago. In the meantime, the family is enriched by three sons-in-law and four grandchildren. I thank all of you for the role you play in my life and the love I receive. First and foremost of these, of course, Maria. You are so important to me. And it is very unfortunate that so much uh, nowadays has to take place in digital form in times of corona. Ik heb gezegd.